Well, the presentation's up here, so if, if people could reorient. So my name is Dana Bryson. I'm the deputy manager at the Carlsbad Field Office. And we have responsibility for the National True Program, as well as the Waste Isolation Pilot Plan. And so I understand, and I fully understand, why you would have questions on the events at WIP. So I'm here. I'm going to give you a, a brief presentation. And um, really, the questions are what it's all about, because um, you know it, we're here to respond to, to your questions and to help you understand. And so I really focus more on the questions side. So in February, we had a fire in the underground uh, involving a uh, salt haul truck. You can see that most of the problems came from the two front tires that burned, thick black smoke. Um, so that was on February 5th. On February 14th, we had a radiological release. Um, that has been traced back to panel 7. In here, you see the end of panel 7, and you see the, the bulkhead door in the background there. So there's about 100 feet of waste between us there. The current status is that all waste handling activities have been suspended since the fire incident. Uh, the Accident Investigation Board was formally appointed and has started a formal investigation. They've returned a report on the fire in March, and they've returned a report on the radiological release phase one in April. So because we haven't fully identified the exact source, phase one focused on the responses to the radiological release. Phase two is dealing with it more holistically uh, from the source and why it happened. Uh, and that's phase two as the investigation uh, continues. So the Accident Investigation Board brought experts from across the country in the DOE complex, and they are fully uh, independent of the Carlsbad Field Office or any of the generator sites. Uh, in addition, we have an independent arm uh, of enforcement in DOE that is involved in reviewing what's going on. And of course, we have our regulators for WIP, which is New Mexico um, uh, Environment Department and uh, the EPA. So the investigation into the cause of the radiological event has kind of focused on panel 7. And here, this is the very end of, of room 7 and panel 7. And this picture right here is being taken from that corner. So you kind of get a perspective. There's that steel bulkhead that I was telling you about that you could see at the end. And that's about 100 feet of waste there. We've kind of narrowed it down to an event zone. Um, the reason we can do that is because we um, see evidence of, of high heat in, in those areas, melted plastic, uh, charred uh, material, that sort of thing. So the, the, the potential mechanisms for causing that and dispersing the uh, radiological contamination. Um, we started with a very broad range of possibilities. Uh, one of them was a change in the type of the absorbent used in the waste stream. Um, we're, we're actually leaning more and more in that direction, but we still haven't ruled out other causes. And. Um, as of yet, we haven't reached any conclusions. We keep, we keep gathering additional data every entry. And we're making about two entries a week. Um, 
Investigation-wise, they're evaluating the source of the contamination. Uh, this is through the entries into the underground, uh, which always has at least one uh, accident investigation board member with it, as well as work on the generator streams. We've got uh, reviews of the processes going in two uh, generator sites right now. And we're doing a lot of sample analysis and evaluation of, of uh, waste streams. And near and dear to all of our hearts, the 3706 project, um, we really tried to salvage this by uh, sending waste to WCS uh, and, and then with the plan of then sending it to WIP. Um, that's kind of been put on hold. Uh, the shipments have been stopped as a precaution. That makes meeting this deadline uh, very difficult at this point. Um, we, we haven't reached the time period where if we started shipping tomorrow, we couldn't make it. But um, right now, it looks very unlikely that we'll start shipping tomorrow. Efforts continue to meet the goal, uh, but we, we are all being very upfront that safety is the top priority. And, and we, we can't get better by trying to hurry and making the same mistakes that got us here. The WIP recovery is taking place. We have an integrated project recovery team chartered and in place. Uh, they're uh, developing a recovery plan, which the contractor is on track to get to DOE at the end of the month. I'm, I'm sure you all saw the uh, administrative order that WIP got uh, yesterday that asked for uh, a plan and a schedule on uh, closing uh, panel seven, room seven, uh, and uh, panel six. That is part of that recovery plan. And so um, with that, plan being due at the end of the month and with the administrative order response due on the same day, that creates some logistical challenges. Uh, we're going to work through that, see if we can pull that ahead of the rest of the plan. And of course, we will uh, be in constant touch with NMED. Federal and contractor staff are both being augmented. Uh, at the facility. Uh, we've gotten a lot of corporate reach back into the contractor. In fact, uh, one of the next phases of work scope, which is replacing the uh, HEPA filters uh, that were contaminated when they engaged as they were supposed to when contamination was um, uh, detected in the underground and they protected the environment. But now we have to start planning for, for replacing them. And the staff at WIP, um, because it has been so successful, have never really had to deal with high contamination levels. And so um, we really wanted to get people that were used to and practiced in this, and especially for HEPA filter replacement, um, it can be a tricky operation, and so we've got uh, people from Savannah River lined up to do that. On the federal side, um, I have really been humbled by the, the support we've gotten from the other DOE sites. We've had facility reps come and support us. We've had um, people from, from all aspects of, of nuclear safety to uh, industrial uh, health and hygiene to all of those elements that we needed to properly oversee uh, the operations and, and keep in mind that when these accidents started happening, we had to make the decision, look at it and say, okay, 
all of our safety management programs are suspect. Uh, our work control is suspect. We need to assure that everything we do from here on out is done correctly. And so we went into essentially 100% oversight mode, which has been long hours for everybody. But um, it's, it's proven good in that we've been uh, catching issues and allowing us to upgrade as we go along, as well as assuring that we're doing work correctly. And then from the uh, Accident Investigation Board reports, uh, they identified justifications of needs in there. Um, they're essentially findings. And so in response to those two reports that have been issued, uh, we are developing corrective action plans. Each report has uh, John's uh, justifications of needs that affect the contractor, affect the DOE field office, CBFO, and affect headquarters. And so we will have corrective action plans for all of those entities for each report. And really, that's going to be necessary before we can resume full operation. We've been looking at the ventilation system and upgrading it because really, this facility was never designed to operate under filtration. And because of the contamination in the underground, we are really required to operate under filtration to do so safely. So um, we have um, a, a facility half a mile underground that was designed to be operated uh, with maybe five times more airflow than what we're currently able to get. So right now, under normal operations, the air would go out these ducts. This goes to a shaft that goes down to the mine. And so under normal operations, this airflow would go out these ducts through these um, 700 series fans and out into the environment. Because it's clean, you're just recycling it through. Um, now, when the contamination was detected in the underground, these automatically shut off and air was automatically diverted into these HEPA filter banks and this goes through one 700 or 860 series fan and the HEPA banks, two, two banks, they're, they're pretty big, but still we can only max out at uh, 60,000 cubic feet per minute. And in order to operate diesels, to um, move salt, to mine salt, to do roof bolting, ground control, all of that, we need more airflow. So now what we're doing is um, just signed off on a, uh, starting a procurement that's going to double our HEPA filtration capacity. And we're looking at more electric operations in the underground. And we're looking at scrubbers for our diesel exhaust. So we, we want to uh, start operations so that we can uh, maintain mine stabilization, and ground control, uh, you see uh, here, and start our decontamination and, and essentially resume operations once everything is fully understood. Uh, issues are all on the table and we've formally corrected them with uh, verification of those corrective actions and effectiveness. So in the long term, um, we still have to pinpoint the cause of release. Um, we have to do uh, a culture change in the facility both on, on the contractor and the DOE side. Uh, we, we have our corrective action plans that we're finalizing and that we will have to follow through and, and complete and validate and verify the effectiveness of, and then, and only then, can we return to full operations. Um, so here, this is the waste base, and 
behind this full, this is a, a bag of magnesium oxide. And the reason why we have these in there is that they will uh, absorb the carbon dioxide, which will, if water were to ever get in there, say 10,000 years from now, um, it would reduce the mobility of, of any uh, contamination that would be in it. Yes. Okay. So, so here you have a magnesium oxide bag. Um, they're typically between three and four thousand pounds, <coughs> and and so uh, down here you have. Is that a standard waste box? Here you have a six pack. Um, basically, these are all the, the various containers that are stacked too high. This is looking at the top of it. This is the back of the mine or, or the, the ceiling. Uh, there you can see the bulkhead behind it. So it's row on row going back here and they're just put in place with the forklift. These things on top are, are slip sheets. And um, so behind this intact bag, you can see what looks like piles. So essentially, the, the bag, which if you think um, like the woven plastic tarps that you buy at the hardware store, that's kind of what this material is. It, it's just designed to contain it until it can be put in place. And yes, everything in here is vented. Okay, so and then the large containers, um, the standard waste boxes, have drums inside of those containers. And everything's vented. No. In fact, what you've got are the vents are on the side for a lot of these. On the ones where the vents are on the top, you've got a spacer up there to prevent a back pressure from happening on the back. So let, let's go into that then. So back here, you can see where you had magnesium oxide bags where that plastic uh, outer cloth melted, essentially. Uh, a lot of the, the slip plates and the plastic wraps around, like the, the seven pack, seven pack of drums have just a plastic wrap around them. Um, so back in this area, back behind here, you can see where that's all melted and it looks like um, an exothermic or a heat generating reaction took place. And one drum in particular, um, we can see where that um, reaction seems to have been particularly centered and the lid is popped, pushed off. In fact, there was a, a bag on top of it, and it pushed up on that bag and popped itself open. And so for something inside of that to have done that, it would have had to have generated enough pressure to overcome the vent, which is designed for a, a slow gas buildup. And, and force that up. Now, there have been a lot of uh, decisions made on the fact that that was the kitty litter that had carbon. Uh, is how extensive are those decisions? And how, how clear is it that that is, in fact, 
It's standard uh, for chemists and, and across the complex in, in work that's done in, in uh, uh, canyon facilities and, and anything to, to really um, know that you do not mix <coughs> organics and nitric acid. You, you tend to get bad results. And if an organic material like kitty litter were mixed with um, highly acidic nitric acid, I, I would give you the same answer. But the exact nature of the processes and what happened, we're still looking into. And so um, things that are, are really making us look twice are nitric acid, <laughs> organic material, um, and, and different process anomalies. And like I said, we're evaluating two different sites, generator sites, uh, in those areas. Gerard, you've been very patient. You have a question? I just want to know, I, I could wait to the end because I do want to talk more about what we're, the subject is now, but you have a few more slides to go, right? Yes, sir. I'd like to wait until he's finished and then ask those questions. Thank you. Okay. Bob, the floor still yours? I, I was wrong. I've still got several questions. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, has the drum been identified? In other words, the Los, Los Alamos knows what's in that drum. If it's been identified. We have a drum, which I described to you, that I think is uh, something we, we need to pursue. And in fact, our last entry was really focused on trying to get identifying numbers on that one drum or on any of the other drums in the seven pack so that we could um, index and figure out which drum that one was. Um, due to the charring and, and the, the video quality, we weren't able to get that. And so um, our next entry uh, tomorrow we're going to try and do that same thing again. Okay, because unless you can actually identify what's in that drum, you actually have no reason to believe that uh, the kitty litter uh, is the problem. I totally agree with you. And uh, if, uh, I mean, uh, some of those drums are full of glove box gloves. Yes. And that's essentially 80% rubber. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and, and we have information uh, in which we know that uh, plutonium-238 will uh, degrade that uh, rubber into little fine particles and things. Uh, and it seems like there is a lot more of a question or a lot more knowledge about uh, other waste uh, than the kitty litter. I totally agree with you, and that's why I tried to stress up front that we are not ruling anything out. We, we are trying to identify all the potentials and, and trying to work to narrow that down. But as I said, we, we've got some some higher possibilities than others, but we're not ruling anything out. We're, we're trying to get down to specifically what drum did that happen in, what was the initiator, and what was in there, and narrow it down further from there. That, that's why, uh, like I say, we're, we're not focusing on any particular individual site. We are not eliminating uh, any waste streams from consideration. We have some waste streams of concern, and based upon those concerns, we're taking appropriate um, 
I thought action. the press has said this was Los Alamos drums. Who said that? The press. The press. Thank yes. you, sir. <laughs> but uh, uh, Whip has not uh, changed that uh, possibility uh, that it is, in fact, Los Alamos drums. We, we give press releases daily. We, we have not narrowed down the way streams. And I don't know what to do beyond that. Now, once you have established what's in that drum, you can do something. Absolutely. But there's decisions that are being made by DOE that uh, are assuming that it is the carbonized uh, kitty litter. When, when we see the potential <coughs> for an issue, if it's a safety issue, we have to address it, even the potential. I agree with you, it would be um, preferable if we had all the data and could zero in on something that was proven. Uh, but until we do get to that point, when we come up with potential safety issues, we have to address them. And when you finally identify that drum, which is important. Absolutely. Uh, then you'll be able to make some uh, scientific uh, assessments on what that might have been. Now, in the original uh, uh, contamination or uh, that was released, uh, I've always seen that there was plutonium-239 mm -hmm. or plutonium, anyway, mm -hmm. americium-241. Mm -hmm. How about uh, plutonium-238? Has that been seen? There, there was one instance where we got a, a lab result to that. See, this is very critical because there's very intensive knowledge on what happens when plutonium-238 is involved in, in a drum, is in a drum. Los Alamos has this information. And, uh, and, and this would be of great help if we could ever establish whether there was any plutonium-238 in there. And I can assure you that we are on daily meetings with the scientists in Los Alamos and Savannah River. And they are asking questions like you are asking. And they are asking for the additional information they would like to see. And we are examining our capabilities to get that remotely and planning our next entries to try and do those things. Yeah. I have, I have next Gerard, and in this order, Nana, Stephen, and then Danny. Gerard? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So <clears throat> I'd hate for kitty litter to be the scapegoat because I use organic kitty litter <laughs> at home. Be and, careful what you feed your kitty. Yeah. So I appreciate the information and the presentation. And um, I thank Bob for kind of bringing to light some of these other um, materials and mixtures and relations that some of us really don't know. Um, but you, you did say safety is a top priority, and I want to go a little bit off of that. And then I have one last thing towards the end that was a concern of mine. And I'm glad there a lot of more controls are being evaluated and looked at. And it looks like things are, um, there's a couple of different tracks that are in place right now and evaluations taking place and then some actions taking place and 
what can we do in the future to make things better. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we still have an issue. Yeah. You know, and you did talk about that you're still trying to identify the drum. To me, that's a concern right there because there should be inventory control. I, I think that the website should know exactly where things are at because we don't want to go back into this um, legacy waste type of issues ever again. Mm -hmm. And we are moving waste legacy, the true waste, over to WIP. And in particular, we have you know, pits that we don't know where things, what things are in there. And, and excuse me, let, sure. let me address that since, since you raised that specifically. We do know where everything is at. The issue is we have a particular seven pack of drums that's mm -hmm. of interest. And normally you, you've got the, the numbers on the drums and you can identify, we know what sequence they're in, but we don't know how it was placed in there at the time. Okay, and so that again is something I hope that will be able to be put in place in the future that you'll know exactly where the, you know. That's a lessons learned. And, and it's a tough lesson to be learned because the concern there then is, you know, regardless if it's kitty litter or some other compound or if it's an organic compound that is mixed in with other drums or within that sequencing, are we waiting for more lids to blow? And I know that we were told before that it's, and I appreciate, you know, Mr. Bishop telling us it's a low level type of radiation exposure that we're used to in the home as it is if we have any type of yeah. detection device. Um, but seeing the blow on that lid has me concerned that yeah. this isn't really type of a low level. So I think Bob is asking some really good questions because those are things that we really, really need to know. And then you're going to have to go back into that inventory, of course, and then find out, gosh, what else is in there? What has caused this and what other materials are in these drums that have caused this? And if it's unknown, then we have another set of problems on our hand. Then we start to lose the public trust as to why we've done this to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I would really like to, for either this board to either formally, however we can do it, to make sure that uh, a full investigation be done on this. And I know that there are controls, and this is all due respect to what is the types of things that are being evaluated and now being put into place. But a full investigation is really needed as to what is causing this, what has caused this, what will be prevented in the future. But again, this is really critical. I know it's a small thing, and what was a small thing to begin with is now be turned into a little bit bigger than what we expected. I know we don't have all sorts of high-level radiation being sent into the atmosphere. That part is good. But this type of issue is beginning to rub me a little bit more into the acceptable, okay, things are under control, because it seems like it's getting bigger. Uh, I try not to be too redu redundant on that. Um, so along with that, I still see that there's got to be some relation with the fire and the leak somehow, some way. It's just, it, it's, it's bugging me, and it's just the logic in me until I'm proven wrong. And that's what's great about science, the way I understand it, it's, pro it's until you prove it wrong. So I want to find out still if there's, there's got to be a relation there. And I know you all are looking into that, but please, whatever you can report to us. The last thing I'll bring up is um, when WIP was ready to send down a team um, to go ahead, a, a, a human team to go down, that was delayed because the monitoring, the lapel monitors, um, the PPE was not in place. My concern there was from a safety point, again, because safety is a top priority. The concern I have is WIP fully equipped with the right type of PPE, right type of equipment, any type of equipment for low level or even large. So this was a low level um, situation, but the, the proper PPE wasn't in place. Now, if the PPE, if the lapels, and I know I'm kind of being a little, breaking this down into minutia, but if the, because there's a larger view of this. If the lapel PPE was not there or if it had lost the freshness state, if it had expired, then why isn't that being replaced? Why isn't that type of inventory control being done? So there are some management questions I have 
based on these little things that are now turning to big things. And um, so those are the concerns I have, and I'll repeat again that whatever type of full investigation that, that we can recommend or bring forward, because it is our true waste that's going to whip. And there's, you know, I answer to a lot of people, well, not a lot, but there are people that have a lot of questions. And they're asking me because they know I sit on this board. And I've been able to answer, and I, did, I forwarded like some of the answers that uh, Mr. Bishop gave me uh, the past uh, four months. I was able even to, into my class and into my, with my students. But now this is becoming more of a bigger thing. It's been, a, and on CNN it was, it was a bit of a mockery over this kitty litter issue, and I know it's irritating you all, and it's not so funny. Mm -hmm. But to me, again, this is reflective, and is this endemic, and I hope not. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. If I could, just sure. in response okay. to that. Please, thank you. Um, you know how I said earlier that <coughs> after the first incident, we had to reevaluate our safety management programs. We had to try and build them back up, and, and we put extensive oversight in them. Um, radiological controls, bioassay, all of that was part of it. And, and so I, I agree with you. I mean, we, we need to have those controls at a higher bar. And that's what we're pushing to do. And that was one of the reasons why we didn't immediately go storming down in there and, and take immediate action. We took maybe six weeks to uh, get our ventilation system where we needed it because um, uh, we weren't happy with its performance. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do. But still, it could do better, and we wanted to get that sealed up and, and corrected. And the if, if I could, safety management. Program. That there is my concern. The six weeks, I have no problems with that. But when that six-week period was ready to send a team down, everything you had the green light. You know, monitor, the lapel monitoring was not available. They weren't ready to go down because of that. So that brings, you know, in the back of my head starts to bring forward, yeah. wow, they, they, they took a look at everything, but didn't they forget the little things like PPE? Actually, they, they had the lapel monitoring available, but people made a, a decision and said, okay, in refreshing our PPE and bringing it up to standards, we ordered all this stuff. We have new version of lapel monitoring uh, equipment coming in tomorrow. We have this old stuff which we're not convinced is as good as this and they made a decision and and I support that decision. Thank you. Dr. Girardi. Hi, I have a lot of questions um, so I will ask a few and then give other people a turn and maybe come back to me later. Not quite sure where to start and what to leave out, but you said that it's due to the press that um, we may have some inaccurate information or be concentrating on reactions between kitty litter and I never nitrates. said that, ma'am. I never said that. Well, you you implied when speaking to, um, to Bob's question. Who said that? The press. Thank you for saying the press. The press said that. We did not say that is what you said. So this would be an opportunity for you to, um, or other people here, to um, clarify or explain what the other, some of the other possible um, mechanisms or materials being looked into at this time are um, and you know and briefly and in an unclassified fashion of course um, you know tell us what leads you to believe one thing versus another um, and perhaps a bit of what would be the implications um, if it were one or the other of those um, waste streams or mechanisms of, you know, of leak. I'd be happy to. That's, that's one thing. Um, another thing is, even if this was not the organic kitty litter and nitrates issue, 
is there a possibility or a fact of those two things being mixed in a wake drum with radioactive isotopes or other hazardous radioactive toxic etc materials anywhere in anyone's waste stream and what's being done about that um, and you know, it seems like there's often an issue of contractors and subcontractors and oversight and management and this and that, and why are there so many layers? Why can't it, you know, be done by somebody who is responsible and not distributed out to somebody who can always say, well, they were supposed to do that and we were supposed to do this. And another thing is, you know, we went on tours of WIP and they showed us that everything was safe and everything was great and everything was clean and everything was so well run and everybody was being careful about everything. How did it happen, you know, that routine maintenance wasn't done on the truck to clean off the oil that probably led to the fire or is that just a press, you know, a press interpretation and what, you know, and what really happened there? Why aren't there drills done so that it would be familiar to people um, what they would need to do to investigate this type of accident you know, if it happened? It seemed like that would be a type of drill. A drum bursts, stuff comes out. It could be any of the kind of stuff in any of the waste streams. What would people do with it? What equipment would they need? Um, you say, well, this place wasn't designed to be run with filtration. Well, if it's storing, you know, radioactive waste then there, and other hazardous materials, there might be times when it would need to run on filtration. And how's that going to work and for how long? And, you know, what do you need under those circumstances? Mm. So answer some of those and I'll give someone else a turn. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you, you bring up some very good points. And I was brought on in December and asked by the manager to address some of those issues. And uh, the emergency management side, uh, the maintenance side, um, the, the drill side. And we were starting to address that. Um, but as you point out, you know, it caught up with the facility. And, and I think you were pretty accurate in describing uh, the, the accident investigation boards cause for the fire, um, those things all need to be looked at and, and need to be addressed. And um, getting back to an earlier question, the Accident Investigation Board really is not just a review. Th this is um, a very formal, very in-depth uh, accident investigation. Uh, court reporters, um, everything. They, they've got experts on every subject. They're delving into it and, and their point is to get to the bottom of it and to identify all the things that need to be corrected before operations can resume. And so we are taking that very seriously. Now you, you uh, asked about what we were doing and where we were going with getting to the bottom of it and, and what, what we're looking at and considering. Um, we initially went in with understanding that something had to have uh, happened to cause the energy for the release. So going back and, and reviewing the process that certifies characterizes, certifies, and allows waste to go to WIP was top on the chart. One of the key aspects of that is the acceptable knowledge uh, process. And essentially in that, uh, you coordinate with the generator site and you try and understand the, the life cycle, the history of that waste and, and 
essentially using process knowledge to understand what should be in that waste. And um, so we went off down that path with several generator sites trying to understand um, if, if uh, we, we didn't get uh, really to the heart of that process knowledge and if we can do better. We also looked at the, the nuclear forensics from the accident, the um, um, isotopes that we collected on our filters that we were seeing, and from that ratioing, trying to decide, okay, where could these have come from? Now, now that's further complicated from the fact, well, if it's one drum, that's one thing. If it's multiple drums, now you're getting into a more complicated scenario. So now we have to have the right nuclear signature, and then we have to have something that would have mobilized it, a mechanism. Um, so looking at that, if the acceptable knowledge process uh, was correct and what we were told <coughs> was true for each waste stream, then there never would have been an issue. And, and so we need to fully understand that and figure out how we can improve that process to uh, prevent this in the future. You've heard about nitrate salts. Uh, you've heard about organic materials. You've heard about high acid drums. Those shouldn't have been uh, allowed to occur. And so we need to go back and look at the process and figure out how in the future that we will assure that those don't happen. So before I move on, Stephen, yeah. Mr. Um, Kendall, if I can ask you, would you like to address the board? You know, and I think if we figure, finish up with questions from Mr. Bryson, then I could, could speak either before or after the break. I think that'd be, that'd be fine. Okay. Stephen? Yeah, I think Nona expressed very well the frustration a lot of people feel uh, about the vagueness of the information which is coming out. And uh, you said you would address her questions about other scenarios, but other than this mixture of organic adsorbent and uh, nitric acid, really nothing specific seems to have been said. Uh, but to, so I think it's very frustrating to many people that a lot of the information that comes out is in terms of, oh, we're looking at this and we're looking at lots of different scenarios, but it's never specific enough to give sort of credibility to the fact that you really have much of an idea, which you well may have, of what's going on. So I think you have a serious public relations issue here, as well as a serious technical problem. But I had a couple of other questions that were more specific. Uh, one is, can you give us any kind of timetable for when you might expect to actually understand what happened in that drum? Like, we'd hope to have an answer in a month or six months or, you know, three months or whatever. And do you think you can get to that answer without actually physically examining the drum in question or drums in question which would involve moving material so people could get in and actually look at it. If we can remotely get that answer, that's preferable. I, I would prefer not to put workers in the position of, of moving those drums and getting back into that phase. But if that's what we have to do, we will work out a safe way of doing that. And do you have any idea when that decision well, would, would be made as to whether or not you right, can do it? Right now, as I said, we, we have daily phone calls with uh, Lanel and Savannah River and, and get ideas for uh, what information they would like to see, how we can, can obtain it and process it. And so we've got two, tentatively, we've got two entries planned into next week um, where we will try and get additional information, samples, uh, pictures, and ideally if we can identify any one of those drums in that seven pack 
that would help us narrow it down. Um, samples might be able to help us narrow it down. At, at some point before long, we will have to go into the fil uh, heap of filter change out, which could be up to a month. And so um, we're anticipating having our plan at the end of this month. Uh, we're anticipating uh, getting the heap of filters changed out, uh, collecting as much information as we can to try and narrow it down further. But as you say, if, if we're unsuccessful remotely, we will have to go in and, and access it directly. Okay. Now, the state has given you a fairly short timetable to close this up. And at one of the news conferences a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Flynn at the time said, uh, you need to close it up as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Did do, do you, you know, I suppose you're <laughs> negotiating with the state about when you'll do that, but do, do, once you do that, you can't investigate much more. So, uh, and and keep in mind that this whole area is an investigation scene, and we have to get approval from the board before we do anything because it is an investigation scene. So, um, we we take the state's uh, order very seriously, and um, li like I said, um, we're we're looking at doubling the ventilation flow by the end of the calendar year. Uh, we're looking at getting back down into the rest of the mine to try and uh, support ground control and, and maintain the mine in a safe condition. And of course, uh, in our planning for recovery, uh, we're laying out how we can address um, the state's um, order and provide some um, substantial uh, closure mechanism for those panels, that, that room, uh, in a timely manner. Two other quick questions. Uh, the first one is, is there any connection other than possibly management issues between the first fire and the second incident that you've been able to discover? Well, what's blatantly obvious is the timing. And, and um, that's hard to get around. As far as uh, proximity, it's uh, thousands of feet separated. And um, I have not seen any mechanism that would connect the two other than that. And do you have any sense of, well, one, will WIP ever open again? And two, if it does, how far in the future that would be? And if it's a long time in the future, what DOE can do in the meantime to meet some of its other commitments, such as getting the 3706 campaign brought to conclusions? Well, we, we, uh, we're on the way to addressing that through WCS. And, and now with this waste stream concern, uh, we took the, the right course of action and, and treating it as a real safety concern. Uh, as I said, a potential safety concern has to be addressed. Um, with, we, we should be having some activities in the mine within a matter of months. Um, getting the waste hoist back into operation will increase our flexibility. Uh, doubling the ventilation flow, the filtered ventilation flow at the end of the year will increase our, our options. And if we are just to the point of operating one diesel at a time uh, for roof bolting or salt hauling, uh, that's what we'll do. But we, we need to lay out the plan and lay it out so it's safe. And um, as I said, the, the plan is being uh, developed. Uh, it's been in development for a while, but it, it's due at the end of the month. And we've rolled um, the state's uh, requests in with that, uh, of course. And we intend to have them all coordinated in a comprehensive plan. 
I have Danny, then Doug, and then Mary. Go ahead, Mr. Mayfield. Thank you, Chairman. And I'll try to be brief. A couple things. You just mentioned, sir, um, that you have to get approval from a board. What, what board do you have to get approval from? Well, I, I was just uh, trying to stress that the Accident Investigation Board is a, a formal uh, investigation of an accident. The, when they first showed up, uh, the entire site was an accident scene, and we've slowly narrowed that down. And so when we go back in and do anything around the waste face and the source of, of the, the, the material, the radiological release, we have to coordinate that with, with the Accident Investigation Board. Uh, coordination or approval for them to allow you to do what you need to do? Well, it, it hasn't held up anything, but it is very formal. Um, second, uh, just a couple other questions. You had a, a slide up there with the magnesium oxide, the two to 4,000 pounders. Yeah. Uh, I think the majority of us did a tour, if not a couple tours of, of the WIP site. Is that being done post this incident, or have you always had those magnesium oxides in these, on these containers? They, they've always been in there. I believe they're a, a requirement of the permit. Okay. And, yeah. and, and then you indicated, um, I'm just kind of looking at my notes, that they're, um, they're, there's some, some spacing for venting. What are they venting if these are enclosed containers, enclosed drums? The, the drums are all vented um, because you'll, you'll have uh, radiolysis and other means of generating gas, uh, slow generation. Okay. Um, kind of the, the dialogue that's taking place. So uh, have you all identified if it's one drum, 20 drums, three drums? Because I've been hearing one drum a lot of today's conversation. Well, we have one drum that it's pretty clear. We have other possibilities. Okay. And if you, you look at the pictures, and the pictures are all on our website. If you look at the pictures, you'll see weepage on, on many containers in the heat affected area. And uh, what we're postulating is that the seals have basically degraded. And so those could be potential sources from that aspect as well. And could the denigration of any one in particular drum have impacts on other adjacent drums? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, so I'm going to ask this because, again, I, I kind of go by what's reported in the media too, and I'm probably the biggest one who doesn't take a, a verbatim what the media says. And but, but with what has been reported in the media, sir, um, and if it is determined to be, um, you know, unfortunately, one of our drums from our 3706 campaign, do we need to go back and look at every single package of 3706 campaign material that we are touting as a great success? And I think it is. And, um, but it does cause me some concern if it was coming from Los Alamos. I think it's healthy to go back and look at all of our processes. And, and reevaluate. Um, you know, it, if you look at it, nobody was hurt in either of these accidents. And I think we're blessed from that. And I think we would be missing a great opportunity if we did not seriously look and identify everywhere where we need to improve and take those lessons learned and correct them. And that's, that's the path we're on. So I guess in conclusion, this will be my last question. Um, based on, on the order that, or the recommendations come out from Secretary Flynn from the Environment Department, if you're asked to go and close that up, are we not, or, or you potentially will not do any remediation of the drums that are leaking? Are they just going to put a, close them up in place and it's kind of, that's going to be it? We're just going to see if this salt mine works based on leaking material down there? Keep, keep in mind the design of WIP. The, the containers are not, are not the primary containment. Right. The mine and the salt sealing behind it is really what is designed, what is planned to um, maintain this material uh, separate from the environment for thousands and thousands of years. And it's been proven that when this is allowed to seal up, 
that that, that is better than any man-made uh, artifice. So, so I guess in conclusion of that, wherever we go forward today, and, and knowing today's technology and tomorrow's technology, are you planning on putting at least cameras in these in these future sealed areas so that until that camera lasts, maybe that camera lasts 20 years, maybe it lasts 100 years, so we can monitor what's happening once one of these cells is closed? Those are all good questions. Do we have any right now in any closed cells, any cameras to monitor what's going on in those cells? We do not have any cameras in the underground. That and is, when I first got there, that was one of the questions I asked. And when we had the first accident and I was in the control room, that was the first thing that I wished we had. Well, I'm talking close, future closed cells, once the cells are closed up. Just keep a camera in there until it works no more. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Denny. Doug? Um, <coughs> concern about the ventilation system. Uh, you indicate that those upgrades are going to be made this year and will be in place. Is, is that an accurate uh, evaluation that that can be done? We're, we're doing the engineering on it and the procurement and we expect to have it installed at the end of the calendar year. All right. That's our current schedule. Very good. The other question is have you been able to evaluate the entire panel seven to say that that this this is the only area that's shown a, a, a potential problem, or is there other areas that maybe you've surveyed and, and identified that there's possibly a problem in panel seven? Well, um, if we just seal off room seven of panel seven, we would still have some some uh, decon activities required in panel six and and potentially other places um, but the only place where we have waste in panel seven right now is in the very end of panel seven but have you been able to survey and say you know the rest of uh, the rest of panel seven is not a problem other than this particular area i guess that's what i'm trying to look at it well, are we only looking at one area or are we looking at there's other things that you, you haven't been able to survey the entire panel to say there's other problem, possible problems. Room six, as I said, and then um, the exhaust drift has got to be contaminated. We haven't sent people in there yet, but I'm just planning on it being contaminated. So we'll have to deal with that as well. Thank you, Doug. We're going to go to Mary, and then we're going to move on. Um, Bob, Nana, Gerard, I know you still have questions. If you can hold those uh, for a second, and um, um, we'll get back to your, your questions as soon as we can. But go ahead, Mary. Thank you, and thank you for the answers and explaining <coughs> things. I was questioning about when you said that um, it was the certain, you knew what was in the containers and then they were placed together. It was just a problem because you didn't know actually how they were placed, that they, you know. Mm -hmm. um, knowing when we did go down there, the rooms were sealed and I think that was one of my biggest surprises when I heard about it was they said that the rooms are sealed immediately when they're filled or, but I thought that, um, my concern is I guess that then in the other rooms, if there are containers possibly with the same things in there, and we don't know how they're adjusted. Will that ever have a problem or it won't now that they're sealed? Once the, the panels are sealed and there's no ventilation flow going through them, there's no communication with the, the rest of the environment, the, the salt will just slowly flow in on it and ultimately crush those drums and seal everything off. Um, but there will be... Uh, hundreds of feet of, of solid salt between them and the rest of the mine. Right, and I think they were just explaining to us though the time that it takes for that to happen. So I was just concerned, could this possibly happen? And then is that front door that we saw, I guess, will that be enough protection then to not have this release at all from any other panel? The, the door, the steel bulkhead as you're talking about, that that is uh, being used in addition to other methods. Uh, three of the panels have uh, blocks, block walls, ceiling. Uh, all of the panels have 
um, a cloth and, and run a mine salt. Um, and, and so that needs to be finished up on panel six to make sure that, that there's not any direct access between them. And um, we're, we're looking at, at all possibilities uh, in responding to the state. And uh, it will probably be a combination of things. Okay. And just one last okay. thing real quick. I think when you said it was going to WCS, and I apologize because I'm new to this area. So, um, But when it goes there, is there a chance then that anything at WCS right now could possibly be containers that contain anything similar, that we could have that same situation there if it is a combination of seven containers as opposed to just one? Isn't that what you mentioned earlier, possibly? There, there are, are various levels of concern. Uh, you, you've read about the nitrate salts. Um, that, that's, that's identified a broad waste stream. And, and so uh, Lanel, uh, WIP, uh, NMED are all addressing that waste stream. But within that waste stream, there, it, it's not a uniform risk. And, and like I said, the, the scientists at Lanel have been doing research. Uh, they have been um, trying to identify where the potential high risks are and uh, where we might have outliers that could have initiated this. Um, that's one possibility. But again, where you have the potential, we, we have to treat that as if it might happen. And so that's why we're addressing the entire waste stream, even though um, the majority of it probably is not an issue or even potentially an issue. 